Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayek Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study on the road to Calvary. This is book two, and we are on part eight today. This is titled, Seeing Jesus as the End. Now that we have seen the way of the blood of Jesus and our need to walk it in repentance and true brokenness, we must ask ourselves, where does it lead? What is its end? This is an important question because the various ends we naturally set before ourselves in the Christian life are often very different from the one great end to this way which God has appointed. It is this fact which accounts for the continual frustration we so often experience in our Christian lives and service. The natural thing is for us to think that the way of repentance, humbling, and surrender will lead us to being made powerful in his service, to being much used of God in winning souls, to having our church filled with an increasing number of seeking souls. In short, that it will lead to revival and to spiritual success. Much that we have read of the lives of outstanding men of God has led us to believe this. We have read that there came a time in their experience of being broken down before God, of full surrender, and of being filled with his spirit, from which time it seemed God was able to use them mightily. How easy it is for us to think that if we go the same way, we shall arrive at the same end. Even as we submit to the Spirit's conviction and seek to repent and surrender more completely, we have this end in mind, and there lurk mental pictures of what we shall become one day. I remember the embarrassment in my mind when having given my testimony of the Lord's dealings with me to a fellow worker in the field of evangelism, he asked me, has all this meant more fruit in your meetings, more souls being saved? I was embarrassed because I could not say that it had, and I felt it should have, and I certainly wanted it to be so. It was the end expected both by myself and others and I was disturbed that it had not worked out that way. Others of us may be willing to let God deal with us and to put things right, because we feel that in this way we are going to have peace and happiness and become the joyous, released personalities we have always longed to be. That is the end that we have in mind. Yet others have the thought that if they are willing to be broken, and repent, it will provoke the other person to repent as well, and there will be a much-needed relief from tension in the home. That is the end in mind as they seek to respond to the Lord, an easier situation in the home. And so we could go on. None of us need look any further than our own hearts to know the ends to which a full response to Christ is normally thought to lead and which often become the motive for such a response. It is because these and similar things are ends that God seldom allows us to achieve them and that we are characterized by so mute striving and frustration. They are the wrong ends. That this is so is made clear when we understand what Jesus said was the true end of the way. To get his word on the point, we must go to John chapter 14, the passage with which we have already been dealing and in which he says, I am the way. Follow the argument of the passage. Jesus had said a surprising thing to his disciples. Whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Well, Thomas replied, that is just what we don't know. We don't know whither, nor do we know the way. Oh, yes, you do know the way, said the Lord in effect, for I am the way. Knowing me, you know the way. But where did the way lead? To the Father, of course, 
For he went on, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But the Father was not unknown to them either. For he continued, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. Well, Philip, quite puzzled, joined in at that point and said, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices thus. It was in reply to this that the Lord uttered those stupendous words, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Thus it was they discovered that they knew both the way and the whither, for the Lord Jesus was both. For us too, he is both the way and the whither. In finding him, men have not only found the way, but the end too. We do not have to go beyond him to something else to satisfy our needs. He is the end of all that we need and the simple, easy, accessible way to that end. In the light of this, we can see what some of us have been doing. We have been availing ourselves of Jesus and his blood as the way, but to ends other than himself. We have been willing to go to all lengths to put things right, sometimes at great cost to ourselves, because the end we seek is seen to be so desirable. The intensely earnest soul will pray, God, I will pay any cost to have revival, to enjoy thy power on my ministry. But in the shadows around those ends, there often lurk the subtle motives of self-interest and self-glory. Little wonder then that in spite of our agonizings in prayer, God has not allowed us to reach those ends. Even if our motives are quite free from self-interest, those things are still not to be the end nor the reason for which we get right with the Lord. Our end is to see the Lord Jesus himself. The reason for which we are to get right is not that we might have revival or power or even to be used of God, or have this or that blessing, but that we might have him. Our sin has caused us to slip his hand. A cloud has come between his lovely face and ourselves, and at all costs we want to find him and his fellowship again. That and that only is to be the reason why we should be willing to go the way of repentance not for any other motive than that we want him. He is to be the end. But alas, other ends, idols, all of them, have taken his place in our hearts. The story of the ten leprous men who were healed by the Lord Jesus is a graphic illustration of this. Of the ten, only one, when he discovered himself healed, return to Jesus to give him thanks and glorify God for his healing. The other nine held on their way, eager to enjoy the new life into which their healing from leprosy had introduced them. To them, the Lord Jesus was but the means to the end, the end being for them a life of health. But to the other who fell down at his feet, craving fellowship with the one who had healed him. He was not only the means, but the end himself. Such is the humility of our adorable Lord that he is willing in the first days of our spiritual experience to be a means to such ends as peace and happiness and power. Indeed, with men in their sins, enlightened self-interest is all that God has to appeal to. What is the gospel appeal? Flee from the wrath to come. But an appeal to such self-interest? And as I say, he is willing for us to see him and his atoning cross a way to such an escape, to such an end. But not for long can he allow us to go on making him the means to ends other than himself. He knows all such ends will not satisfy our hearts, for we are made for him, and we are restless 
till we rest in him. Moreover, such ends, if that is all we come to, would fail to satisfy his heart. For the Bible tells us that the whole purpose of Jesus on the cross was to reconcile us unto himself. 2 Corinthians 5.19 Again, we are told that God has predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Ephesians 1.5 And that Jesus gave himself for us that he might purify unto himself a peculiar people. Titus 2.14 So it is that he allows us to be frustrated and disappointed in our strivings after this or that end till at last he comes to us and says, My child, I never promised you that if you would surrender, repent, and get right with me, you would have an eased situation, that you would have great power, success in your service, or even revival. What I do promise you is that if you walk with me and allow me to show you sin as soon as it comes in and to cleanse you from it, you will not have these things, you will have me. Make me your end and you will surely have that end and then you shall be satisfied, lacking nothing that is in the will of God for you. The shameful thing is, however, that when this comes home to us, we feel a little disappointed. We have to admit it was not himself we really wanted, but rather his gifts, and that for subtle, selfish reasons. As the hymn writer says, I yearned for them, not thee. That is why he has not allowed us to have them. This explains to me something that used to puzzle me in my early Christian service. Years ago in my evangelistic ministry, it appeared to me that the key to the situation was the Christians. If there was a blockage of sin there, then the Holy Spirit could not work amongst the unconverted. I could find, I thought, various scriptures to support this view. It seemed clear that if the Christians would repent of their sins and get right with God, then the Holy Spirit would be free to move in power amongst the lost. Consequently, I began to devote the first week of my campaigns to speaking to Christians and calling them to repentance. And very often, God would bless them greatly, and there was real repentance at the cross. But when, in the second week, we turned especially to the unconverted, things were sometimes difficult, and there was not always the mighty working of God that I thought there should have been. The reason now is clear to me. Our repenting and getting right with God was a means to an end, the end being that souls should be saved and end other than Jesus himself. We had our eye on all that time we were getting right. And that was why God could not set his seal to it. We were repenting under law as a sort of bargain with God. We were ultimately driven to God in prayer. And when at last souls were saved, it was not because we had repented, but because he was gracious. We should have got right just because we were wrong and because we loved Jesus. And our sins had made him hide his lovely face from us, and at all costs, we wanted him back. That such revived, radiant Christians would be a powerful inducement to the lost to turn to Christ is indeed a fact that would not be for the end for which they repented. The wonderful thing is, however, that when we are willing to be convicted of the sin of making these other things our ends, and to have the Lord Jesus as our only end, God delights to give us with him many of these very things which we are now seeking first. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things, we are told in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. And who can tell us what is not included of his generosity in those all things? What wonderful things will he not do for those who are willing to walk with the Lord Jesus for his own sake? 
Perhaps. The best illustration of this is the incident of Solomon asking for wisdom in 1 Kings chapter 3. When God said to Solomon, ask what I shall give thee, he was, so to speak, offering a blank check. Instead of seeking selfish ends, he simply asked, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people. The margin puts it a hearing heart. That is a disposition of brokenness which is willing to listen to God and to be told what to do by God. God was so delighted that Solomon made this the end that he was seeking that he said, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart. You see, Solomon got the end that he was seeking, but that was not all that he received. God also said, I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. God threw in with the one thing that he desired, the many other things which had ceased to be chief ends for him. And God did so just because they had ceased to be such to him. So it will be with us when we too cease to make other selfish things the end and are content to see in Jesus only our end. With him, God will give us all that is in his will for us. Now we have just considered the ends which we seek, which come short of Christ. Sometimes, however, we find ourselves seeking ends beyond him. We may not fail to see the importance of the way of repentance and the need for the cleansing of the blood of Christ. We may be those who are open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and are willing to come back to the cross when necessary. But we feel that the blessing we seek and need so much still lies beyond. This applies very much to our search for such blessings as victory, power, healing, the fullness of the Spirit, and even revival itself. We believe the blood of Christ and our repentance certainly provide the way to that blessing, but not the very blessing itself. We are convinced that to get right with God at the cross is but the preparation for God's mighty moving in on us. For that we still have to pray and struggle and wait, we feel. We think we must now go on from Calvary to some other place in experience, say, for instance, Pentecost, and that the place of repentance at Jesus' feet must be left for some much more positive position. Reasonable as all this may sound, the result is invariably the same. We have not found the end which we seek. We are left still searching and dissatisfied, still without the glowing testimony when we say, I have found. Surely, God has something better for us than this. He has indeed, but only by our seeing his Son as the end as well as the way. If the Lord Jesus said that in coming to him, men have found not only the way to the Father, but the Father himself, Surely he means that to apply to every other blessing we seek. The glorious truth is that life is himself not only the way to blessing, but the needed blessing itself. Not only the way to power, but our power. Not only the way to victory, but our victory. Not only the way to sanctification, but our sanctification. Not only the way to healing, but our healing. Not only the way to revival, but our revival. And so on for everything else. He is himself made to us what we need. 
in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. In coming to Jesus as a sinner, as so often we must, we find him to be just there all we need. We do not have to go any further than the cross into a blessing, which we imagine somehow lies beyond. Pentecost is found not at Pentecost, but at Calvary, where sinners repent, as is also revival and every other blessing. Way and end are the one person found together in the one moment of each successive act of repentance in faith. Again, in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So we are now in a position to understand the reasons for many of the frustrations in the spiritual life, in our spiritual lives. We have sought peace, holiness, victory, revival as blessings apart from and additional to the Lord Jesus. And they have for this reason eluded us. We have prayed and struggled for them, and we have sought to fulfill all sorts of conditions to achieve them, but only in vain. We have even been willing to walk the humbling way of the blood of Jesus and to let him convict us and bring us to repentance. But even so, the great baptism of love and power is looked upon us as something yet to be received. In contrast to this, let us ponder again Paul's great word. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Romans chapter 10, verse 4. J.B. Phillips, in his well-known colloquial translation of the epistles, quotes it like this. Christ is the end of the struggle for righteousness by the law to everyone that believes. What a pregnant phrase. Christ is the end of the struggle. That for which earnest Jews struggled in those days was righteousness. This is not, in the first place, personal righteousness of character, but something even greater than being right with God, or what we may call rightness with God. In going through the epistle to the Romans, it is helpful whenever you come to the word righteousness to read rightness with God, for that gives the meaning of the word as Paul uses it. It was to achieve the rightness with God that the Jew struggled to keep his complicated law, but his failure to do so only condemned him in his heart, and the assurance that he was right with God on that ground seemed the more removed the more he tried. So too it is with us. It was into this state of need that the apostle came with his glorious message. Christ is the end of the struggle for rightness with God to everyone that believes. You see, Christ had borne on the cross for them the curse of the divine law which they had so often broken. And now, his blood was reckoned to them as their perfect rightness with God, even while they were still sinners, provided they repented and put their faith in Christ. What was before to them but the distant end of many struggles was the beginning and basis of a new life received from Jesus Christ, from which they could go on. They were given the privilege of beginning at the end. The Lord Jesus, however, is not only the end of our struggles for rightness with God, but for everything else, for peace, for victory, for holiness, for healing, for revival. What struggles we have had to obtain these blessings. What excruciating surrender sometimes, what prayings, what self-mortifications, what battles to make our sinful hearts less sinful. But in coming to Jesus in helpless repentance and confession of sin, we have come to the one who in the moment of our abasement 
is the very blessing we have been struggling for in so many other directions. He is our peace. He is our power. He is our victory. And he alone is our revival. There is nothing found anywhere else rather than in him. As the poem goes, the well is deep and I require a drop of the water of life and none can meet my soul's desire for a drop of the water of life. Till one draws near who the cry will heed, helper of men in their time of need. And I believing find indeed that Christ is the water of life. How often, however, is it otherwise with earnest Christians? I shall never forget sharing in a conference in Alsace some few years ago and having the privilege of working with an African leader deeply taught of the Lord and possessed of that rare gift, the gift of revival leadership. The Lord had worked deeply. Many had been convicted and melted and having come to the Lord Jesus with all that he had shown them were gloriously set free and were returning home with their cups running over with full praise to God. A small group who had been at the conference and who had been blessed like so many others approached us and asked us if we would speak the next day at their prayer meeting for revival in the town nearby. They told us that they had been meeting two or three times a week for several years praying for revival. And now, of course, they were going to pray more than ever for revival. It was only before the meeting that the situation really dawned on us. Here were a people who had seen Jesus anew, who had been convicted of their sins and knelt at his feet, and they were freshly filled with himself, and they were going to go on praying for revival. This meant that they had seen Jesus only as the way to revival, and not as revival itself. God gently showed them through the lips of that African leader that they were doing what many of the people did in the days when our Lord Jesus first appeared on the scene in Judea. They were still waiting for and praying for the coming of their Messiah when all the time he stood there among them, unknown and unrecognized. Maybe he did not fulfill at that time their mental picture of what Messiah would be, but today he is at the right hand of the majesty on high, Messiah indeed. In the same way, what God does in our hearts in the way of convicting and melting may not fulfill the traditional conception of revival. But if Jesus has come afresh into the central place, be assured, it is revival. And who knows where this will end if we continue walking with him. It may be asked at this point, are we not then to pray for revival? Our first responsibility is to be revived ourselves and to have a testimony that we have come to the end of our struggle and that we have found Jesus himself as all we need with all that that involves of repentance. Then we and others in fellowship can pray that what God has done in our hearts he will do in other hearts in ever-widening circles. We are not then praying for revival as something that has not yet come, but instead to someone who has already come to our hearts, if to none others as yet. Revival has begun, and it has begun even if the reviver has come to only one heart, and it is now but a matter of, of it spreading to other hearts. The beachhead for new life established in but few hearts needs now to be extended to other hearts. And to that end, God will use our testimony and willingness for self-giving quite as much or even more so than our prayers. Such prayers, however, will be offered by those who know they have found both the way and the end the striving and the tenseness that characterize so much of our praying for revival will be absent 
and a calm confidence and boldness will take their place. Does all this mean that the one who has found both the way and the end in the Lord Jesus has attained all the heights of spirituality that God has for him? By no means. He is still a sinner. He still needs the blood of Jesus. He still needs to repent. Indeed, he is quicker to repent than ever. For part of his discovery is that the way of repentance is the way of proving the Lord Jesus as his all. What then has such a man found? He has found at last where the true treasure is, and he has sunk his shaft into that precious vein, the Lord Jesus. He is not now shaken or disturbed by the report of lucky strikes anywhere else in this doctrine or that experience or the other emphasis, but the strange thing is that after all his attempts to find the answer in so many other places, he has come back to the very same shaft he sank into when God first saved him, that which he sank into the redemption of the Lord Jesus. He now only needs to go daily deeper in that one place, deeper conviction, deeper repentance, deeper dying to self, deeper cleansing, deeper faith, and there he will find the reality and fullness of his living Lord as much as he ever needs. Let us then see Jesus as the end and the easy accessible way to that end, both of them consecrated by his blood for needy people no better than ourselves. Jesus my shepherd, husband, friend, my prophet, priest, and king, my Lord, my life, my way, my end, accept the praise I bring. Well, friends, that brings us to the end of part eight today. And if you're like me, you have much repenting to do. You have much soul searching to do. You have much examination of the heart to do. And most of all, we have much confessing to do. I love you, friends. May the Lord Jesus bless you as you seek to grow in him each day. And may we fully come to understand what it means to be true followers of the Lord Jesus, found only at his feet. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly do love you, and I'll see you on the next video.